Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming here on time. I can already see that you are very busy in your conversations, which is great. Hope it looks about IPv6 well. Um, I mean, you can see the guest Wi-Fi password, but we'll put it on the screen again for the latecomers. My name is Veronica McKillop, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the UK IPv6 Council to our first ever Enterprise and IPv6 workshop. Uh, this workshop has been in making for a couple of years. We've been thinking about it, that this market segment really needs some help with how to deploy IPv6. But as you will see later in the survey results, you will realize that we have, uh, that you have actually done already quite a lot of work, which is very encouraging, which uh, changes the myth that enterprises don't care about IPv6. Well, you are here, that already shows the interest, and um, I would like to just make sure you are aware that all the presentations are being recorded, and the purpose is to, to share them online later on our website. So who are we? For some people, I assume some of you are new here, never been to our event. Could you please raise your hand so we just get a feeling? Well, it's probably like 40% of the room, which is great. Welcome. I hope you come to our future events again. We are really just a technology user group. We are people who are interested in the technology and we care about promoting adoption of IPv6 because, you know, globally the adoption is progressing at some pace, but it could go faster. So we want to aid with that. And we really want to share the experience and best practices because we believe that way people will not be too scared of deploying IPv6 and they will uh, just get on with it. You can see behind me our website. That's where we publish all our presentations, uh, slides and the video recordings. They will be published there as well. So what do we have prepared uh, for today? Hopefully you have seen the agenda when you registered. This is really just a refresher. So here in this first 25 minutes, I'm going to set the scene and also walk you through the results of the survey that we've sent out. And then after me, Tom from BT, he's going to kind of lead us more into IPv6 thinking and how things are changing, um, also from the big service provider perspective. Um, then I will... Um, I would like to bring to your attention a few things when it comes to IPv6 address planning, but I must say I'm not sure that you are going to learn much from me because based on the survey results, lots of you have already deployed IPv6 in your network, so hopefully that will be fine. And we will conclude the morning block with a talk from Tim uh, about the applications and what are the issues when it comes to supporting IPv6. Because in general, everybody perceives that v6 is a network problem, you know? But the further we go with IPv6 deployment and the closer we are getting to be on dual stack and the ultimate target is v6 only because dual stack really doesn't help anyone as you will hear throughout the day. It's really hard to manage and operate. Um, is the applications. So what's happening in that space and uh, what can be done, you know, if you can have conversations internally in your organizations, etc. After lunch, uh, we'll have Fernando talking about IPv6 security. And we have given a little bit more time to Fernando because security is a massive topic. There's lots of also misconception. Uh, so he is tasked to do some myth busting. So hopefully that will be done just right. And then we will have Radek uh, talking about cloud and IPv6 because that seems to be a quite a big driver. There was um, a KubeCon conference in Amsterdam last week and what I've heard uh, there's lots of buzz about IPv6 support in Kubernetes and in general in cloud. The cloud providers have done lots of work and like every month they are releasing new features uh, where IPv6 is becoming available. But obviously not everything is just there yet. So we've got Radek and Nico talking uh, then about Kubernetes and how, how that's advanced when it comes to IPv6 support. And then uh, um, Andre from RIPE is going to tell us about how you can actually have both dual stack and IPv6 only on one network. And uh, I think that's something that's a food for thought for people who are not sure how to go about it. They are struggling with the for scarcity, even private on, the, on your lands. So um, looking forward to that talk. After coffee and tea break, we are getting more into the space of case studies and uh, uh, like experience with different projects. So we will have David from Imperial College London talking about what they have done uh, when it comes to IPv6 quite a lot. They are one of the few uh, high education uh, institutions here in the UK who actually have deployed IPv6 on a quite big scale. And then we will have Andre and Martin talking about Morgan Stanley and their work on the enterprise side and also cloud. 
and the final talk of the day, you might say, is it really enterprise? But I think IoT, everybody believed that was the, and is the application killer for deploying IPv6, just by the pure number of devices that are connecting. However, that's not really happened, and there are reasons why, and Graham from Southampton University, he will talk about that. Depending on how everybody feels, it will be a long day. We might do a Q&A, or if we overrun, we just close the day at that. And, um, and but the important thing is, if you've got time to stay behind, we are going to uh, the Henry Addington pub, which was recommended by the locals. And uh, we are a very social crowd, like to continue our conversations after the meeting. And so you are very welcome to join us there. You might say, okay, like the agenda is very interesting, but is that really all? You know, there's so much more when it comes to deploying IPv6. So UK IPv6 Council isn't just one person. I, I chair the council together with Tim Chown, who unfortunately can't be here with us today for health reasons. But uh, there is a, a, a group of uh, people who we work together and prepare these events for you, come up with the agenda, you know, uh, get the speakers. So this is a list that you see behind me that we come up with, you know. What about, should we talk where and how you deploy IPv6 in different parts of networks? What are the potential issues? The question of accountability with V4, the, the addresses are relatively stable, right? With V6 and the privacy addressing, temporary addressing, it's, this is becoming a different level of challenge. When it comes to wireless, the fact that Android doesn't support ATPv6 is an issue uh, for some. For example, IPv6 VPNs, not only the remote access, but also side to side. Service providers, how do you multi-homing? Because not every enterprise got an autonomous system and is with, over BGP with your upstream service provider. And then the final uh, kind of like the ultimate goal is to run only single stack in your network, that's the IPv6 only. So how do you go about that? Well, I would just say, because there's so much more, and when we put together the agenda for today, we said like, we just can't do it in one day. This, this would take multiple days. So depending on how this is received today, we might uh, organize another workshop in the future, probably not this year, but uh, we also need to get the speakers, the experts who can actually talk to these topics. Questions during the presentations, I let each speaker to manage uh, their own way how people can ask them questions throughout the talk or during the talk, but we will have wireless microphones or we have wireless microphones, so uh, people will get a microphone too if you have a question during the talk. And I really want to thank at this point to Morgan Stanley because if it wasn't for Adam, Andre, Martin and their team to provide us with this space, the council, we are just a group of people who there's no income, we don't have any legal entity, so we rely on organizations and people to sponsor us in a way that they provide a space, they provide uh, taste the refreshments for our attendees, and also that means our events are free. So I really want to thank you very much, guys, because uh, without that, uh, we wouldn't be in this very nice room. You have already seen the information about the guest Wi-Fi. Um, hopefully you took a picture. And so now let's get to what's happening with IPv6, kind of like the setting the scene. You know, because some people, not everybody watches the statistics, not everybody is looking like who is deploying where, you know, what is the growth in different countries, etc. And we, of course, have to talk about the legacy IP as well here. So on the 1st of April, or I think it was, yeah, I think it was around 1st of April, actually globally, from Google perspective, IPv6 has crossed 43%. In general, the IPv6 evangelists and everybody would have preferred that this has happened earlier, right? But there is some growth that is happening, and uh, the most recent number you can see is from last week. I don't have the data from this weekend because uh, there is a little bit of a lag uh, in displaying them. From the UK perspective, and that's, that's very important to realize that we are at over 43%. We're not an absolute leader, like uh, look at France, it's over 73, 74%, they are smashing it. But I would say we are doing really well and there's gonna be more changes uh, and more deployment. This is not gonna stop, uh, this will just continue to grow. There are different views how to look at it. What you see behind me is, uh, the, uh, is the Google statistics. 
but uh, there are different ways how this is measured. APNIC, uh, they measure through Google Ads, so they see over 44%. They at some point actually saw 47%, which in a way would actually suggest that somebody is testing, you know, and they kind of like switch it off, and then uh, so the number drops. And uh, you can see the other statistics from Facebook and Akamai. It is from their perspective how much traffic is coming to their services on IPv6. The point here is, for enterprises which enable hybrid working, people work from home, people work from the offices, even if they don't have IPv6 in their office um, network, at home at least 45% of them have it. So what do you do? How do you actually work with that? You know, People try to connect the devices, prefer IPv6 uh, by nature, uh, Windows OS, Mac OS, that's a normal thing. Uh, some enterprises, especially during the pandemic, had an issue with it, or even recently, that the fact they are telling their employees, sending them instructions how to switch off IPv6 because their remote access VPNs are not dealing well with that. But that's not the answer. The answer is to go and enable IPv6 at least for the remote access. And you can see it. If the growth of IPv6 and the, the uh, ecosystem that is changing around your home connections are changing, it's not enough. Maybe the argument for you would be that IPv4 is getting extremely expensive. Behind me, you can see uh, a page of IPv4.global, uh, which is an IPv4 market broker. And if you want to stress your finance people, your accountants, I recommend, as I said at the annual meeting, that you take the ticker and just push, push it to their desktops. And they will see how much this is going to cost if you actually are not going to do something to offload the demand for IPv4. That means enable IPv6. But the dual stack, as we know, it's not really the uh, final solution. This is their index that they have shared. And you can see that the block uh, price, uh, a price per block you're going to pay, it's a lot of money. And not everybody is willing to spend that. The other interesting move that we see that RIPE is preparing is a change in the fees that the members are going to pay. For IPv6, it's not really that significant because you need to have a really significant allocation, more than slash 32. But for IPv4, the prices are going up if you have more than slash 24 from RIPE. So this is an interesting thing because all of a sudden there's going to be an item on your budget which is going to change, and in some way probably drastically, which is a good move. I like that. So, um, and further, uh, guys from Hexabuilt, which is an IPv6 consultancy uh, company in the US, they've got their own podcast, and they publish a lot of interesting articles on IPv6. Uh, there are two interesting articles about how to justify your IPv6 projects, you know. And this is not just about buying the public IPv4 addresses, which is not just also about the price, it's about the reputation, the geolocation. It needs to be corrected, the reputation needs to be uh, improved if it's not good enough so your traffic doesn't get your user traffic doesn't get blocked but there is also an article about the private IPv4 and actually maybe you could start cross-charging your other department who won unreasonable allocations of slash 16s there was also a panel at Nanoc uh, last year where they discussed the same topic so maybe some imp inspiration for you here Besides that you say, well, I really don't care that the price is going up, I've got enough, you know, or I can readdress to RFC 1980 and it's cool. Um, well, the world around us is changing and this is something you can't stop because the people who are enabling IPv6 are the people who feel the impact of IPv4, not having enough IPv4. And sometimes it's even the private is not enough. So the internet access, you're aware here in the UK, BT, Sky have enabled dual stacks, so IPv6 is on those connections. Every new entrant into the market, all the f smaller providers, fiber to the home providers, they, are, they have to do IPv6. They have no other choice because they can't get a V4 or they have to really go on the market and buy some. Or now the thing is that people are starting to lease IPv4 addresses from other companies because they know they will transition to V6 only, so they do need the V4 um, space permanently, but they need it for the time being, for example, until uh, software features are delivered for the home broadband gateways, right? But you can see behind me just a few examples of uh, large service providers which are working on IPv6, and eventually they are really just going to do V4 as a service, which then has an impact on the user experience. So this is something, even if you don't want to do V6, this is going to impact you one way or the other. The reports of um, 
better, uh, faster responses on IPv6. Uh, there is now recently has been a few articles about marketing and how basically the slower are the responses of IPv4, or even like geolocating the right users. People who live in Utah are getting IPv4 address from, which is located in California, for example. So they are getting advertised uh, kale salads and bikinis while they live somewhere in the middle of a desert. So the, basically there is a mismatch be, uh, between the audience, which is targeted, and what you are selling to them. If you think for marketers, this is a very important thing. So IPv6 can definitely can help with that. Governments. In some cases, we might wish this was here, or at least from Ofcom, that they would encourage the adoption of IPv6. It's not the case. But there are other governments that actually have been pushing for this. You, are, you might not be surprised by US or China. But US, they actually put some deadlines on, uh, on their it's a Office for Management of Budget, OMB, directive, which was published late 2020. And basically, there is a uh, requirement that all federal agencies move to IPv6 only by 2025. They're, they can get exception and they can, um, they can actually keep IPv4 if they've got some approvals, but they have to present a plan how they are going to um, remove IPv4. You say, oh, I doesn't care, you know, we don't live in the US. Well, if you sell to the US government or you supply any sort of products and services, then it matters to you. Second thing is, this put pressure on vendors, be it the physical hardware, be it services, online, the cloud, that they actually, if they want to sell to US government, which is a huge customer for every vendor, if they are selling to them, then basically it's forcing them to deliver IPv6 features, which we can then benefit from. So there is no more excuse that there are no features. Industry pressure, Apple, that's an old story from since 2016, iOS 10. You can't submit an app to App Store unless your app can work in IPv6 only through NAT64. And they are, they are strict. If your thing doesn't work, they are going to remove it from app, app Store, which is revenue impacting. And I would add the cloud uh, support of IPv6 has recently really taken off. We had a really good talk from Alexandra at our annual meeting in December. You can check it out. It's on the website. But everybody else, be it Azure, the Google Cloud, which is uh, kind of a late comer to the market, but they are all adding IPv6. And uh, I heard the, the talk about Kubernetes and IPv6 had a very full room in Amsterdam last week. So uh, things are progressing there because the V4 scarcity is putting lots of pressure on everybody. Behind me, this is from Tim's talk. And unfortunately, as I say, he can't be here with us. There is a list of um, reasons. And I'm not going to go through them. But you will get the presentation. I will upload it online on the website so you can have a look at it immediately. But there is so much more, you know, being the complexity of running two, net, uh, two protocols in the network. Well, you will have to do that, you know, for time being. But the, the NATs, IP4, offloading your uh, NAT44 gateways, you know, sending as much traffic on V6 as possible, um, avoiding building technical debt, you know, a rush deployment because all of a sudden you have no choice. For higher education, I would say we need a workforce that is coming out and is ready. And right now we know, uh, based on a survey that Graham from Southampton University has done, it's uh, like, you know, on one hand you can count the number of universities in the UK that publicly state they teach IPv6 in their computer science programs. So we've got people who are coming out absolutely not ready. Um, there's a lot more, you know, uh, initiative by um, Worldwide LHC, Compute Grid, WLCG, uh, David, uh, he talked about it at our annual meeting as well, how basically uh, LHC is forcing the participating um, research bodies and the universities to communicate with them only on IPv6. So again, there's, things are happening because there is no more V4. So in the last few minutes, I would like to walk you through the results of a survey that we have sent out. You might have noticed mine on that list. I really want to thank the people who have responded. We heard about 33 responses, which is great. Um, um, we're going to do something maybe you can respond today as well. Um, so one of the first questions was, what is your level of IPv6 knowledge? Because we were wondering, people are coming here really not knowing what to expect. But you know, the survey has shown us that actually 
you know about IPv6, which is great, and you are coming here to learn about the experiences of other. So this is really, really good news, you know. The, the readiness is there. Uh, interestingly enough, very few, not everybody received formal training, which is not a surprise, you know. I probably was a lucky one, and when I worked for a vendor, I actually demanded to be sent on a training. It wasn't great, but it was something, you know. Um, it's many, many years ago, so it's okay. Then here it's a, like a type of organizations that people are representing. You can see we've got quite a few people coming from educational sector, so hopefully that's the university, so you guys, you can fix the fact that students are not learning about IPv6. But it's good to see that we have got here a nice mix of um, organizations. It would be nice to have somebody from the government. Um, maybe you are here. This is something that probably surprised us because we were thinking people are not, enterprises not doing V6 because we don't hear so much about it, you know. Uh, but as you can see from the numbers behind me, the total number of people who have done IPv6 is, what, close to 60% in Saveo form? That is a pretty good thing, you know. That's a, that's a very, very good information. But people are also planning or preparing, you know, so I think this is uh, this show how things will change. A bigger question, you know, which uh, wasn't completely exhaustive, so the other answer, as you see at the bottom, the respondent wasn't sure where IPv6 was deployed because probably it's like in so many different parts. But you can see the two most popular uh, areas where people start with the deployment is the backbone network and the internet edge, which totally makes sense, you know. So we are talking 70, 70 over 70%. We will publish uh, the survey, well, you will have it in the presentation and we will publish more about it online. This is also an interesting question because people always say, um, okay, well, we really don't know how to start or where the vendors are, blah, blah, But V6 feature parity, that is the biggest hurdle that, that people have come across. And now it probably isn't just the hardware, now it's more like the vendors are hosting their services in cloud, you know, like cloud enables con uh, wireless controllers, etc., cetera, uh, be it secure firewalls or VPN concentrators, and they don't have the IPv6 support as they have on the hardware platform, right? Software bugs and the lack of knowledge, so the training is absolutely essential. Um, hopefully we're helping with that. We've got here quite a few people from very large organizations. Um, but you can see we've got a mix from different. And this one about the interviews, uh, because people are, you are hiring, are you asking about IPv6? And in uh, one third of responses, the, it's yes, which is good, because for example, when I worked um, at a company, I know that we were working on an IPv6 only project and I asked the managers like, when you're hiring people, are you actually testing them where they don't know if they know something about IPv6, I was surprised. I was like, it would be a good thing to do. It's like, yes, because then we don't, if they know it, we don't need to train them, you know, it's easier. And this is really about the expectations from this workshop. And I think the main reason why, well, it seems from the survey, the main reason why you come here is to learn about the experience of others which is really good to know. That is assurance for us uh, when we organize these events and also get up to speed what's happening in the industry. Um, lots of people are planning to further enhance their IPv6 deployment. That's really good to know. So we hope that we will see more of the IPv6 uptake on the Google graphs and also uh, pursue it and work with your colleagues in other departments to enable IPv6 and take this, uh, take this. You know, further. So we had 33 responses. I was hoping like we can get more, I'm pretty sure. So Tim was very good and he uh, created the same survey for today and it's open now until the evening. And I would like to ask people who have not responded, you can see the tiny URL behind me, IPv6-survey. Uh, if you fill it out, we are planning to actually take the results and write a post about this because it's a unique opportunity to gather data from enterprises or these type of organizations, uh, which is something that's not talked about. Service providers, people can clearly see the numbers or they'd go to like network operator forums, conferences where they present, 
but uh, enterprise is kind of a little bit of an unknown, and people are skeptical that they really don't care. And you, uh, the skeptical voices are very loud on the internet. I think it's important that we have these pro IPv6 voices that are heard and seen on the internet. So we can do something about it because the council has uh, quite a good reach. Uh, and we definitely would love for you to respond. If you have not responded, if you have responded, please don't respond again. You know, it's not necessary. But if you have not very much, it would be very much appreciated. So I mentioned we've got a website. The way we communicate with people uh, is on the LinkedIn group mainly. So you can, um, you can look it up. It's just UK IPv6 Council on LinkedIn where we post all the announcements. If you are not on LinkedIn, you just need to follow the website. We don't have any mailing list because there are so many mailing lists. The other media that we use is our YouTube channel where we post all the presentations that are there, I think since 2017 before that they are hosted on the IET website, but I don't think uh, all of them are available right now. But from 2017, you can see all our talks, uh, presentations recorded and published in our YouTube channel. So what's, what's the next thing? Um, we are going to have an annual meeting because that's what we usually do. It's a, it's a, a day of talks with different uh, with different topics. Today we are really focused on, on the enterprise space. During the annual co conference you are going to have a mix of ISP, enterprises, academia, people talking about standards, what's happening uh, when it comes to the, how the technology evolves. And also um, we are going to prepare, because um, a website on our side, a web page, uh, with the information which UK ISPs offer IPv6. And, uh, I, we think it's the right time because lots of the newcomers into the market are doing IPv6. There are some large providers which are still lagging behind, but they've got work in progress. So this is not about naming, shaming. It's just about providing a place where you can find the information, what's happening in the market. Um, might need some help with that, but uh, to gather the information, but uh, I th we, we think it will be valuable. A few more resources uh, for building your business case or how to go about a deployment beyond what we are presenting today. Uh, RIPE, uh, they have published, I think a year or two years ago, an updated version of the procurement document. Uh, so check that out, it's, it's worth it uh, to guide your buying process because now is the time if you are doing RFPs, you are doing bid purchase, it's time to ask for IPv6 if you have not done so already. Then uh, for some people this might be new or you have already seen it, referred to it, is an RFC from 2014 which talks about uh, IPv6 deployment guidelines. And uh, I think it was Jean Charles from the French task force at the annual meeting. He mentioned that they have actually published a guidebook for the enterprises how to deploy IPv6. It's a lot of information there. It's actually also written in English. It's not just in French. And it's very recent. So you might find it interesting to see if, you, uh, if there is something that would be relevant for your project. Just a little reminder, uh, please remember the presentations are recorded. And that's all for me for now. I thank you for your attention. And I would like to invite Tom uh, from BT to talk about uh, how we should think about IPv6.